Yes, he is. Good morning, Bayleaf. How are we doing today? Happy Reformation Day. The sweetest thing about today is not going to be the candy, but gathering with God's people under his word. Amen? Amen. I hope you've been blessed. I've been blessed. Y'all sounded good today. Y'all sounded good today. Good to be with the people of God. Let's pray as we prepare to worship the Lord through the preaching, hearing, and receiving of his word. Father, thank you for these reminders of who you are and who we are in song. God, I pray these truths written from biblical inspiration would sit in our hearts. We would dwell on them today and be encouraged as your people. And now, Father, as we turn to worshiping you through the preaching, the hearing, and receiving of your word, it's my prayer that your Holy Spirit would come and he would do his illuminating work in us, that he would open our hearts, our minds, our spirits to the reality of who you are revealing yourself to be through your word and who you are calling us to be in light of the image of your son so that we can glorify you as your people in greater ways. And Father, that is our desire. And God, it's my prayer as always that in this moment of preaching that you would increase and that I would decrease. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. I wanna begin this morning with an important truth of the Christian life. Happiness is tied to holiness. Happiness is tied to holiness. As a Christian, your contentment, your ability to live in joy is tied to your ability to live in freedom from sin. Why? Because the closer you are to God, the happier you're going to be. The more intimate your fellowship with God, the more joy you will experience. And I hope this morning that in the course of your life, you have found this to be true. I can testify that in my life, it's certainly been true. That the happiest I have been are those moments when I am walking closest to my God. Because sin blinds us to the presence of God. It quenches our ability to experience him fully. But as we step into greater freedom, as we step into greater Christ-likeness, we get to enjoy his presence all the more. We get to experience the life of abundance that he promised. We get to experience joy unspeakable. And I want you to know, we need to know Bayleaf Baptist Church this morning that God has given us everything we need to walk in this kind of freedom. He has given us everything we need in Christ. That's what Paul's been preparing us for as we've been walking through the book of Colossians. As believers, as Christians, we've been empowered to walk in freedom, we've been given new hearts. We've been given the very spirit of God. We have been released from the bondage of sin. Our debt has been paid, nailed to the cross. Now we can be obedient to the things of God. We can walk in newness of life. We can have new desires to please God. We can have new pursuits all for the glory of God. This is ours in Christ. But we also need to remember that we live in a broken and fallen world. And isn't this one of the most frustrating realities for us as Christians to know all that we have in Christ, to know all that we've been given access to in Christ and still somehow frustratingly still be tempted by the things of this world. Maybe even this morning on the way to church, you felt the brokenness of this World, How could we still let sin into our lives when God has given us everything we need for life and godliness? Here's how Sinclair Ferguson describes our struggle, the common Christian struggle that we all have experienced. The reign of sin has been broken in our life. But unfortunately, the presence of sin still 
remains. This morning, Paul, being the good pastor and shepherd that he is, wants to help us navigate this tension. Help us navigate this struggle. Paul wants us as the people of God to walk in freedom in order to experience everything that God has provided for us in Jesus Christ and to see and to believe that what he offers is better. How is it that we can live in victory over sin? How is it that we can live in holiness so that we can enjoy true happiness? As you can imagine, Paul's answer is tied to Jesus. Jesus, once again, is the key. In order to live in true freedom, we, as the people of God, must look at Christ and look like Christ. If we're going to live in freedom, true freedom, we got to look at Christ and we got to look like Christ. We need to be captivated by all that Jesus is and all that he has given us, the immeasurable riches that are ours in Christ, we need to be captivated by that. And then as we see Jesus, we need to be cultivated into his image. This is the key to true happiness. This is the key to the victorious Christian life. And it's my prayer this morning that some of you are going to walk out of here different because you've been struggling with sin. You've been embracing sin. You've been believing the lie of the enemy that there's no hope for you in the face of the sin that you battle. But I want you to hear me this morning. There's victory in Jesus. There's victory over that sin. You can live an abundant, joy-filled life if you will look at Jesus and seek to look like him. Let's see how Paul encourages this morning in the word of God. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against the the other, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now in this section, Paul is once again directly challenging the claims of the false teachers that We've been hearing about. You want more of God? You want a more true spiritual experience? You want victory over sin? God has given you everything you need in the gospel. God has given you everything you need in Christ. You just need to believe it and walk in it. You need to look at Christ and you need to look like Christ. And I want to tell you, church family, that the recipe For success in the Christian life is the same today. We as the people of God, we need to look at Jesus. And we need to look like Jesus. Let's consider why Paul tells us that these are the the keys, the ingredients to living the victorious Christian life. Firstly, we need to look 
at Christ. We need to be captivated by Jesus over and over again to make sure that our hearts are not recaptivated or recaptured by the purposeless, empty things of this world. If you have been raised with Christ, and I'm here to tell you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been. And that moment when you stepped into a relationship with Jesus, you died to your old self in order to be raised to walk in newness of life. And if that is true, we need to keep our hearts on the riches that we have been given in Christ to escape the bondage of this world. And just think for a moment about all that we have in Christ. Paul gives us a few things to dwell upon just in the first four verses of our passage today. Items that could captivate us and will captivate us for all of eternity. Think about this. In Christ, verse three, we've been given access to God, the God of the universe, our heavenly Father. In Christ, we get him. And this is really good. That our life is hidden with Christ in God because you were created with desires. You were created with thirsts and hunger that was meant to point you to God who is the only place where those desires, those hungers, those thirsts can ultimately be satisfied. And Paul's telling you in Christ, you get to the place where your desires are fulfilled, where satisfaction is found in Jesus we have the ability to fellowship with the God of the universe. Isn't that incredible? A holy and righteous God inviting us, a broken, sinful, but redeemed people into his presence. We get to fellowship with him, to know him, to commune with him, to walk with him. And what's more, we can trust that he listens to us. That he inclines his ear to us. That he receives our worship and he calls us his own. More than that, we still have the son, Jesus himself, according to verse 1, who right now is at God's right hand. I want you to think about this. In this moment, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father, acting as our mediator. He is interceding on our behalf even now. And that's good because we have an advocate who has lived in this broken and fallen world and who knows our struggle. And it's him who has saved us. And it's him who even now sustains us. He will protect us and he will hold us fast in new life. Another thing we can dwell upon. He's given us a new life now and more to come. We've been raised with Christ, verse 1. A foretaste of what awaits us. In Jesus' resurrection, we see a, a picture of what life will be like in glory. Where we will be in the presence of God forever. Freed from the trappings of this world. Freed from the temptation of this world. Freed from the distractions and brokenness of this world. The powers who want to pervert God's beautiful creation. For our own glory rather than God's. And finally we even have the promise of Christ's return. Verse 4. That what he began, he will bring to completion. He's at the right hand now, but church family, he's coming again. He will appear, and the life that we long for and taste of now will be fully given on that day. Oh, aren't these captivating thoughts? Aren't these glorious truths? And this is a small taste of the many infinite riches that the New Testament tells us that we have in Christ. We, people of God, need to see these things. We need to be captivated by them. We need to seek them for the good of our hearts. Because here's what doesn't work in our desire to overcome sin. Here's Here's what doesn't lead to the victorious Christian life. Human precepts and teachings. We talked about this a little bit last week. Chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to the regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch 
referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion, asceticism, severity to the body. But listen to this. They are of no value. How much value? None. And stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What Paul's telling us is the way that we as human beings typically go about managing our sin, it never works. Because here's what we do. Imagine if some weird twist of fate that suddenly brownies and eating brownies are sinful. Now, God would never do that because he's the author of all things good. Just imagine for a moment, somehow brownies have become sinful and eating brownies are sinful. And so you come to church and you hear brownies are the devil's food and you should not handle them. You should not taste them. You should not touch them. And yet in your heart, you know, man, I really love brownies. That chocolate goodness, especially when they're just a little undercooked and they're warm. Sometimes you put a lot, I just, I don't know. I don't know that I can get rid of brownies. And yet I know, God, you say that brownies are bad and I shouldn't look at them. I shouldn't handle them. I shouldn't touch them. I shouldn't taste them. And yet I have this desire for brownies. And so, God, I need you to, to get rid of this desire for brownies. I can't, I can't take brownies. I know brownies are destructive. Father, would you get brownies out of my life? They're everywhere. They're consuming me. I need to get all of these brownies out. Brownies, 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 brownies. So what are we thinking about and our desire to overcome brownies? Brownies. The very thing that we're tempted by becomes our focus and therefore reinforces the temptation. And Paul's saying, you got it wrong. You, gotta, you can't focus on the sin to overcome the sin. You gotta focus on the Savior. You gotta, you gotta have a new desire a new affection, a new hunger, a new thirst, because otherwise you will never be able to put your sin to death. You're gonna to try to manage it, but we haven't been called to manage sin. We've been called to put it to death. I was reminded of a, a story from Greek mythology, of all things, that one of my favorite pastors in America, Sam Storms, used to illustrate the need for new desire in the Christian life. He refers to the stories of Odysseus or Ulysses, you may know him as Ulysses, and another guy named Jason. Both of them have great mythic fictional journeys. And both of them on their journeys have to deal with these beings called sirens. Do you remember the sirens? They were demonic cannibals. Doesn't that sound terrible? Demonic cannibals who could shapeshift into beautiful women to appeal to men, and they would also sing. And anybody who heard their song would be lured to them, and in being lured to them with the promise of satisfaction would only find destruction. And what Sam observes is that both of these men deal with the allure, deal with the possible destruction in, in very different ways. So here's what Ulysses does. He tells his men, you guys, you need to stick some wax in your ear so you can't hear the sirens. But I want to hear it. I want to see how bad it is. So here's what you're going to do. I want you to, I want you to tie me to the mast. Get the strongest material we have, bound every inch of my body to the mast, and do not let me go despite what I say. Now here's how Ulysses was able to resist. The songs of the sirens were more than he in his own will could have resisted. He was utterly seduced by their sound and their mesmerizing promise of immediate gratification. One siren even took the form of his wife, hoping to delude him that he had finally arrived home. And were it not for the ropes that held him tightly to the mast, Ulysses would have succumbed to their invitation. Although his hands were restrained, his heart was captivated by their beauty. Although his soul said yes, the ropes prevented his indulgence. His no was not the fruit of a spontaneous revulsion, but the product of an external shackle. Now, Jason had a very different approach as he went about looking for the famous golden fleece. On his journey, he brought along a musician 
whose name was Orpheus. And Orpheus had incomparable talent, especially on the lyre and the flute. And when his music filled the air, it had an enchanting effect on all who heard. There was not a lovelier or more melodious sound in all of the ancient world. And when the time came to pass the island of the sirens, Jason didn't put wax on his ears or tie his people to the boat. He asked Orpheus to play his most beautiful and alluring songs, and the sirens did not stand a chance. Jason and his men said no because they were captivated by a transcendent sound. The music of Orpheus was an altogether different and exalted nature. Jason and his men said no to the sounds of the sirens because they heard something far more sublime. They had tasted something far sweeter. They had encountered something far more noble. Now, what is false in Greek mythology is true in the Bible. And I hope you're getting this. We cannot fight the temptation of sin on our own. We can't just restrain ourselves. We need new delights. We need a new heart. We need to be captivated by something more beautiful, more sublime than the temptation and sin around us. And that can only be found in Christ. Are we captivated by Jesus? Are you looking at Jesus? Because you will only be able to walk in freedom if you are captivated by him. We need to look at him. That's step one. And we need to look like him. Look at Jesus, look like Jesus. Having been captured by Christ and all that he has given us, we then need to be conformed into his image. We have a new life, a new heart that now seeks to please God as we were created. And there's no greater way to please God than to look like his son. Because No one pleased God better than his son. So in order to be like Jesus, which is now our desire to please God, Paul says we have some spirit-empowered work to do. Because here's the truth. The more you look at Jesus, the more we realize that we don't look like Jesus. Isn't that true? The more we sit before the, the mirror of the word, the more that we encounter Christ through the work of the Spirit and the Word, the more that we realize there's a whole lot of stuff in Jared, there's a whole lot of stuff in you that doesn't quite measure up. I see his sacrificial love and I think, man, I've got a lot of selfishness in me. I think about his mercy. I I think I got I got some cruelty in these bones. His devotion to the will of God, and I think, man, I'm I'm pretty passionate about my own will. His his purity and we We see these things and we think, I need to grow in Christ's likeness. And the great thing is, we desire to now. We we want to be more like Christ, even in those places that we see where we're not. And so we begin the process through the work of the Word and the Spirit, according to Paul, to put off some things and to put on some things. We've got to put off those things that don't look like Jesus as we behold him. And we've got to put on those things that do. And both are necessary according to verses 9 and 10. Here's how I think about it. Your kids play with Play-Doh, right? Everybody plays with Play-Doh. Some of your kids even eat it, but that's not the point today. (laughs) You know how Play-Doh now has these cool little forms, stencils, that look like animals? And so you you get the Play-Doh and you... You flatten it, you roll it out, and then you take that stencil, you take that form, and you stick it on the Play-Doh, and suddenly what was a blob looked like a fish or a hippopotamus or an elephant. And all you got to do is remove those outer pieces of Play-Doh that don't fit the form. That's what we're called to do in the Christian life. We got this blob. God has put a form on us that's Christ. And we're to look at the the scripture to see what needs to be removed and what needs to be put on so that we look more like Jesus. So let's start with the putting off because that's where Paul starts with the putting off. What do we got to put off? Well, a lot of stuff as it turns out (laughs) because we're we're pretty simple people. A lot of things in our life that don't honor the Lord. In fact, Paul needs two lists to even begin to touch them. 
And the first list is a a little bit more internal, a little bit more personal. We see it in verse 5. It has to do with selfish desires, or beginning in verse 5. Selfish desires, where we seek to gratify ourselves and objectify others. He says you've got to put off sexual immorality, referring to any kind of sexual relationship outside of marriage. You need to put off impurity, which is contaminated character, compromised by sin. You've got to put off anything that causes you to put one foot in the Christian life and one foot outside of the Christian life where your passions, your pursuit is divided. You've got to put off passion, which specifically here is Paul describing lust, a driving, lustful, objectifying desire that is more captivating to you than the beauty of God. We need to put off evil desire as opposed to good desire, misplaced desire as we get to the the root here of things that do not honor God. We need to get rid of covetousness, which is idolatry, misplaced worship, greed, thinking that the thing that someone else has is what's going to bring me satisfaction if I can get it. Now, I could spend a lot of time on this list because my guess is many of us in this room are struggling with some of this stuff even now. And certainly in our culture, these things are running rampant. But let me just say one thing right now. It's really hard to be captivated by Jesus and at the same time be captivated by an image on a screen. What are you delighting in? Are you delighting in Jesus? And the list two is a bit more external, a bit more interpersonal. It has to do with things that lead to social destruction, things that can cause division and give the enemy a foothold in the church. Anger, smoldering hate, and a lack of forgiveness. Wrath, an unrighteous desire for destruction or rage towards someone who is created in the image of God. Malice, a desire to hurt someone that Christ died for. Slander, a desire to hurt someone through speech. Obscene talk, foul or abusive language, locker room talk, destructive, objectifying words. Lying, not speaking the truth in love. Not speaking the truth at all when we are supposed to be a people of truth. Now again, I wish we could say that these things aren't characteristic of the Christian church, but I think we all know in the past two years, this kind of language, this kind of behavior has shown up all too often in our churches because they're characteristic of our culture, right? And we've allowed our culture to determine the way that we interact with, speak to, and treat each other. Let me say this. It's hard to be captivated by Jesus and be captivated by 24-hour cable news. It's hard to be captured and captivated by Jesus and be captivated by social media. Unfortunately, I would say a lot of Christians look a lot more like people they encounter on social media or they watch on a TV screen than they do look like Jesus. And again, it begs the question, what are we delighting in? What are we pursuing? What are we looking at and seeking to be like? Because all of these things are evidences of sinful hearts. They are the reason, according to verse 6, that the wrath of God is coming, and it is coming. And if we are in Christ, those lists should characterize who we were, not who we are. They are not representative of Christ and should not be of his people whom he calls holy, set apart, and beloved. That's who we are as the people of God. So what do we need to put on? Well, we need to put on Jesus. We need to put on the the things, the the traits, the characteristics that describe Christ. And and Paul lists them there for us in verses 12 to 14. 
we need to put on, in the empowerment of the Spirit, compassionate hearts. Genuine concern for one another. Kindness. Genuine care for one another. Humility. Placing others before ourselves. Meekness or gentleness. Patience. Trusting in God's timing and bearing with one another because all of us are on the same journey and there's not a person in this room who has arrived. Forgiveness because of all that we have been forgiven in Jesus. And finally, the most important of all, love. Because it is the trait that allows all these other traits to bear fruit in our life. We love God because of how he loved us. And it's that love that enables us to love others. Now, friends, who does not want to live this way? Who does not want to be described by this list as opposed to the other lists? If you've got any work of the Spirit in you, I hope that you don't want to be described as sexually immoral, impure, lustfully passionate, full of evil desire and covetousness. I hope that you don't want to be described as angry, full of wrath, malicious, slanderous, got a filthy mouth who lies all the time. You don't want to be that, and probably you don't want to be around people like that. It's destructive. It's consumed with the the things of this world. But don't you want to be around someone who's compassionate? Don't you want to be someone who's kind and humble, meek, patient, bearing with one another, forgiving, loving. Doesn't that list just make you feel good? Can you imagine encountering a person who embodies those things? That's what it was like to be around Jesus. Don't don't we want to be that way? Don't we want to be like him to to splash living water on people and edify people and build each other up rather than destroy them? Trusting and knowing that when we are walking in that way, it's not only for the good of the church, but also for the good of ourselves. Because when we're walking in that way, we're walking in fellowship with God. We're walking in joy and true happiness, not threatened by people, but loving people. Not trying to, to break them down, but build them up into the image of Christ. This is what is available to us who are in Jesus. It is possible for us to be described by that putting on list in the empowerment of Christ. Don't you want to live the exchanged life? Don't you want to live this victorious life? Jesus defeated the old self so that you could put on the new. Here's how Major Ian Thomas describes it in The Saving Life of Christ. Christ died not only for what you have done, but he rose again to live in you, to take the place of what you are. His strength for your weakness, his wisdom for your folly, his drive for your drift, his grace for your greed, his love for your lust, his peace for your problems, his joy for your sorrows. Praise be to God. Do you believe It's possible to live in that kind of victory. Do you believe it's possible to live in growing and greater freedom from sin, growing in greater joy and happiness, awaiting the day when Christ will come again and make it complete? One of my favorite passages of Scripture is in Romans 6, where Paul's describing the fact that we are dead to sin and alive to God. He's He's rejoicing in the grace of God. And there's a rhetorical question that he asks that certainly was probably asked around him in verse 1 of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul, in order for people to be amazed by the grace of God, should we sin a whole bunch? Like have great, great sin in our life so that we can show the, the great grace of God? And Paul says, certainly not, absolutely not, because it goes against who you are in Christ to continue in sin. That's not who you are anymore. You're dead to that. You're alive in something new. And so he says in verse 12, do not let sin reign, therefore, in your mortal body 
to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. That's a command. Do not let sin reign. Do not let your members, do not let your body be once again be consumed with sin as an instrument for righteousness. It's an expectation of us who call upon Christ as our Savior and Lord to walk in obedience, to walk in victory. But here's the beautiful thing about this command. It's an empowered command. You can do it not because of your own strength, but because of Christ. You can do it because in Christ you have a new song that you're hearing. In Christ, you have something new to captivate your heart and your eyes. You have something better. Something that you will look at and celebrate and worship for all of eternity. You have the beauty of God. You have the beauty of Christ. Will you look at him? Will you seek him? Will you be captivated by him? And in so doing, will you seek to be like him? For God's glory and your good. How can we respond this morning to this really powerful text that God has given to us? Let me just ask you some questions to help us navigate our response. Firstly, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you died to your old self and been raised to walk in the newness of life? Because, friends, the wrath of God is coming against sin. And if you're not in Christ, if you're not allowed him to take God's wrath upon himself, you will bear that wrath one day and for all of eternity. Would you step into a relationship with Christ today by repenting and believing in him, confessing with your mouth that he is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead to be saved? I want you to find joy today. I want you to find satisfaction and recognize that everything this world promises you will only lead to your destruction. Quit listening to that song and get a new one in Christ today. For those of us who are in Jesus, are we looking at him? Are we captivated by Christ? I want you to think about your week. Think about one day this week. Let's think about Tuesday. How much of your day did you spend being captivated by Jesus? Growing in captivation to him. How much of your day did you spend before the word of God, learning about Jesus and and falling in love with Jesus? How much of your day did you spend listening to, to music that stirred your heart for Jesus? How much of your time did you spend in godly community that sharpened you to be more like Jesus and delight in him that day? Now compare that to how much time you spent on your phone. Compare that to how much time you spent on social media. Compare that to how much time you spent looking at a screen or watching TV. Here's the reality, guys. What you delight in will show up in your life. I don't want you to feel condemnation. I just want maybe conviction. Maybe we need to grow a little bit. Believing that if I seek these things and just begin this week with The ones Paul gives here in verses 1 to 4, just dwell on those things. God, Jesus, new life, return of Christ. Just dwell on those things and see how your heart is stirred. And are you looking like Christ? Are you putting off the things that don't belong in your life and are you putting on the things that do? Let me ask you some questions. In fact, I want you to bow your head for a minute. I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit to help you discern. Are these things still in your life? Are they still a part of your life that you need to get rid of in order to be conformed to the image of Jesus? 
Is there sexual immorality in your life? Do you have and are you engaging in sexual relationships outside of marriage? Is there impurity in your life? Desires and loves that are compromising your commitment to the Lord? Is there lustful passion in your life? Are you captivated by false beauty other than the beauty of God? Are there evil desires, covetousness, thinking that if you just had something else, some other material good, that your life would be better? Are you angry? Are you wrathful towards someone desiring their destruction? Are you malicious, wanting to hurt people who disagree with you or are different from you? Are you slanderous? Do you use your tongue to demean rather than build up? Is there obscene talk coming from your mouth? Foul, abusive, destructive, objectifying language. Do you lie? Would you just ask the Spirit to reveal those to you in your heart? And if there's anything in your life that's there on this page, would you just ask Him to help you remove it, to put it off in the empowerment and life of Christ? What about putting on? Are you compassionate, kind, humble, meek? Are you patient? Do you bear with one another? Are you forgiving? And are you loving? Is anything lacking in your life? Does anything need to grow? Would you ask the Spirit to help you? even now, grow in this. You guys come back up here with me just for a minute. Let me just tell you the importance of godly community in this as well. The Lord uses the the word and the spirit to sharpen us and shape us, but he also uses godly community. And let me just encourage you and challenge you to stay rooted to the people of God because there are things in our lives that we may not see apart from the help of godly brothers and sisters. we got blind spots. And I may not see those places that I fall short without a godly uh, man or woman speaking those things into my life. One of the, the great joys of marriage, and there are many of them, is that it helps us grow in happiness and also holiness, right? Nobody sees me more than Jordan. And there are times when I'll do something to the kids or I'll say something to the kids and she'll say, Jared, that wasn't very Christ-like how you handled that situation. And I need that because I want my kids to see Christ in me. I want me as a father to help grow their love for their heavenly father. And it's good to have Jordan in my life to see those places I'm falling short, to point them out to me in love so that I can grow in them. Not always easy, but good. And the same thing is true for our greater Christian family. You need to walk closely with people. You need to give them access into your life to see the places that you can't put your finger on because you're too close to say, hey, when you said that, when you did that, that wasn't very Christ-like. To help you probe into your heart, asking, what am I seeking? What am I focusing on that would lead to that that I wouldn't see apart from godly fellowship? So let me encourage you. If you're not involved in a small group, get involved in a small group. If you're not walking closely in discipleship, get involved in a discipleship relationship. Walk closely so that we, together, can seek after Christ and look like him for the glory of God. Amen? Would you bow your heads? Father, would you help us know how to respond? And would you find us faithful in that response? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You stand and respond as the Lord leads. (laughs) 